Golden State Sacramento, a classic kind of game where it, at the beginning it's the star that's kind of carrying things while the team figures things out. The Kings kind of have a little bit of a lead. They're holding the the Warriors at bay, but Steph's going crazy. He goes crazy in the first half. Goes crazy again to start the third quarter. Goes on a crazy run to put the the Warriors up eleven in the middle of the third quarter. Hits a step back three. Hits a mid range pull up and a pick and roll. Hits a driving layup off, over, against a double team against Harrison Barnes, where he beats him to the to the baseline and lays it up and just starts talking shit. Then caps it off with a movement three at the top of the key where he gets fouled. Uh, gets a, a four-point play, puts the Warriors up 11. But what I thought was interesting, because Steph was amazing, finished with 41 points, he's amazing. I, I can sit here and talk about how amazing Steph is all night long. But what I found, found to be super interesting in this game was the run that the bench went on in the late third quarter. Uh, they went with an interesting kind of front court combination of Trace Jackson Davis with Moses Moody and Jonathan Kaminga alongside Clay Thompson and Chris Paul, and they were really good defensively. During that third quarter run, the three, uh, those three, Trace Jackson, Davis, Moses, Moody, and Jonathan Kaminga were on the floor for four minutes, and they were plus seven, and logged a defensive rating of 63.6, which is outstanding. And what stood out to me most, mostly was the overall amount of athleticism on the floor with that group. Trace Jackson Davis is basically like a really big wing. If you factor in his mobility, obviously he functions offensively as a big man, but like he's got the mobility and lateral quickness that you see in a lot of wings. And he's got the versatility to kind of function as a wing when it comes to covering ground in rotation, which is something that the Warriors have never really had from the center position outside of Draymond in the, in this era. It's almost always been bigger, slower players that are occupying those minutes, right? And there was a specific play that I thought demonstrated this really well that you guys can see um, on my Twitter feed if you go back where I talk about this particular trio. But Tracy Jackson Davis gets a block in drop coverage at the rim on the left side of the rim. As a result, which by the way, already impressive defensive play. But in the scrum, the ball ends up flying to the top of the key and uh, to a wide open shooter. And I think it was De'Aaron Fox, if I remember correctly. And both uh, Moses Moody and uh, and uh, Jonathan Kaminga close out to the top of the key. When they both close out to the top of the key, the ball gets swung to the corner. When the swing goes to the corner, Trace Jackson Davis rotates from under the basket where he was in drop coverage to chase, I think it was Keegan Murray, out of the right corner, chase him off the line. Moses Moody realizes that him and Kaminga are on the same guy. He sprints back and guards JaVale McGee. Uh, Keegan Murray drives towards the left, towards the middle, and throws a kickout pass back to the top of the key. Jonathan Kaminga, who's a freak athlete, digs down to contain that drive from the uh, from the left side, right? And then recovers out to the top of the key to contest a three-point shot and force a miss. So again, uh, like like the the you get the high-level rim protection from Trace Jackson Davis on that play, but in the chaos, you leave two open shooters. But because you've got athletes on the floor, they're flying out to those shooters and they're chasing them off the line and forcing them into tougher shots. And that that kind of like athleticism uh, out of the front court again. Like athleticism on the perimeter has its own value, but when especially when you have bigger athletes, they can help you a lot when it comes to contesting shots and flying around in rotation. And that's kind of an aspect that we haven't been used to seeing from Golden State in their bench groups. And I thought that was a really exciting kind of stretch of basketball to demonstrate what they could be getting out of the bench over the course of the season. Um, again, plus seven in four minutes for that trio, 63.6 defensive rating. Hard not to get excited about that. Another solid Jonathan Kaminga game. He was plus nine in 26 minutes. Uh, had a nasty tip dunk. Made some defensive plays. Uh, I, he had a, a play where he beat Davion Mitchell in a post up. That's that matchup, ta- a matchup attacking stuff that I like to see. Hit a very important corner three before the half that kind of changed the tone of the game. Jonathan Kaminga's a lot better than I thought he was going to be this season so far. And again, especially through 82 games or reps, it's very possible that he could be that playoff forward that Golden State's been looking for. Uh, I really liked Chris Paul with that group too. And, and and this is that concept where like having an adult to run the show in a lineup that has young players works. It, it, like cuz again, when you threw Jordan Poole in with those groups, it's almost one of those things where like the total aggregate call it basketball IQ, call it like ability to slow down and execute, that whatever you want to refer to that trait is with those groups kind of dipped below a level where it became freakishly inconsistent. And you would have stretches where Poole's making shots, Kaminga's making plays, and they would look great. But then you'd have stretches where it would just absolutely crater when all of them are making bad decisions. And what's nice about having Chris Paul out there is he's kind of the adult to run the show with the kids. And again, like 
I know they're not kids, they're grown-ass men, but I mean, within the concept of basketball, to have that super experienced, methodical player out there to kind of get all those guys in the right spots goes a long way to helping those lineups be consistent. And, when, and again, when you juxtapose that with the, the Jordan Poole experience, that's what you're hoping for. You're not trying to win games with the bench. You're trying to keep your starters and where they are at in the game, try to maintain that progress so that when they come back in the game, they can build upon it, though. And like there were times when the, uh, when the Warriors won games with their bench, and that's great, but the consistent experience is actually better here. Chris Paul is really good at just finding the easy shots that exist on um, on the basketball court. So like there was a there was a sequence um, there was a sequence in the uh, early fourth quarter where he ran pick and roll with Dario Saric, and on the first one he just like gets downhill into Sabonis's chest, like caves his chest in with a hard power dribble and makes a layup uh, while the defenders come in from behind in back pressure. And it was kind of interesting because you could tell like Chris Paul really hit the jets on that play. And it felt like he was almost trying to send a message. Like I am willing to score here. If you guys just let me go downhill unimpeded. Right. And then on the very next possession, they run another pick and roll. But in this case, Chris more methodically is trying to set up Dario Sarge for a shot. So when he comes down over the top of the screen, they both converge on Chris because he had just scored by dropping his shoulder and getting downhill. Nice, easy bounce pass to Dario Sarge in the short corner for a little 17-foot jump shot that he's going to make probably two out of three times when he's that wide open. That's just easy, easy basketball. And again, like there are, we talk about this all the time, but like offensive ratings, if you look at them for the league, you know, the best teams in the league are around 120 and the worst teams in the league are around 110. It's really not that much of a difference. There's less than a 10% difference between the best teams in the league and the worst teams in the league, right? And so what's actually happening there is like it's the little things on the margins that are the difference. There are easy shots that exist in games. The teams that find those easy opportunities more frequently have higher op- offensive ratings. There are difficult shots that take place in the game. These are rescue possessions, late game situations. The teams that are good at converting those usually have higher offensive ratings, right? Chris Paul is not the guy that's going to make a ton of really, really tough shots and, and lift you up in, in terms of the super high level shot making. But that's not what you need. That's what you have Steph Curry for. What you need is the guy that can execute and find the easy shots that are available to be had in basketball games. Like You're not going to be able to run a Dario Sarge pick and roll with Chris Paul at the end of a game and get a wide open 17 footer. They're, they're going to they're probably going to switch the action and force Chris to make some tough shot. But in the year, at beginning of the fourth quarter, when the game is more fast and loose, like they're, those, those are there to be had. And Chris is the guy that's going to make sure you get those. And you're seeing that manifest in the scoreboard. So, so far through two games, when Steph is on the floor, the Warriors are plus 2.3 net. So outscoring their opponents by 2.3 points per 100 possessions in 142 possessions, according to cleaning the glass. Now that number's lower because they lost the Suns game, right? But like you expect to be positive over the course of the season, probably around seven or eight points per 100 possessions when Steph's on the floor. That's great, right? That's you. That's what you can depend on thanks to Steph being one of the top five players in the world, right? But when Chris Paul is on the floor so far this year and Steph is off, the Warriors are plus 3.1 net in 62 possessions. So outscoring opponents by 3.1 points per 100 possessions. And again, that's a small sample size, but so far you are winning the minutes when Steph is on the floor, off the floor. That's important. Again, again, like when you want to have your best chance to beat the best teams in the league, you can't hemorrhage points with the bench group. Chris is giving you a better job of surviving those particular minutes. And again, like in the, it's not just without Steph on the floor there either. Because like I would argue, Draymond Green is either the second or third best player on the Warriors. Probably the second best player with how poorly Andrew Wiggins has been playing to start the year, right? And so, and really for the most of last year as well. So like. Like you're really without your second and or your your best player and your uh, second best player in this case, right? And so what, what's interesting about that is like the Warriors love to tie Draymond Green to Steph Curry, and the main reason why that's a good idea is because Steph and pick and roll actions brings the offensive firepower to the action. It actually makes more sense to run Chris with more offensively skilled. Uh, big men because he's not going to be as active as a scorer in pick and roll. This is a concept we've talked about over the course of preseason. and But one of the problems is, is over the last couple of years, often Steve Kerr has had to play Draymond Green with some of the groups without Steph because they've struggled so much. That was a big part of the, the story last year, if you guys remember. And it's because they're just grasping at straws. Like, how do we win these minutes? We're getting, we're losing these minutes. We got to get Draymond in with those guys so maybe we can get stops and maybe that'll carry us over the top. But if you can actually go the way they want to go, which is keep Draymond tied to Steph so that you have that 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 offensive potential of those two and Draymond's defensive ceiling, right? But then also be able to float your minutes 
when Chris is out there with uh, Dario Sarge and Jonathan Kaminga or whoever it is, Trace Jackson Davis as well, if they can float those minutes without Draymond and without Steph, that's where you get that classic Golden State mixture that they're shooting for. Um, so far through two games, the Warriors have a 108 defensive rating. That's pretty solid, especially when you consider they're against the Kings and the Suns in those two games. That's not an easy task. 95 defensive rating in the half court. That's solid, solid as well. Big, uh, solid as well. Biggest areas of opportunity. They got out rebounded in both games. Although I did think the guards competed better against Sacramento. The guards are who got killed in the Suns game, but I thought they competed better against Sacramento. And they need to find a way to get Andrew Wiggins going. There's something going on with him. He's just in a little bit of a funk. I don't know if he's just not in shape. I don't know if he's just struggling to fit in with the uh, uh, with all of the other young guys being more aggressive. But when they were at their best, Andrew Wiggins was their second best player when they won the title in 2022. So that's something that I'd like to see them figure out. Uh, on the Kings front, De'Aaron Fox at 39. He's locked in so far this year. He's 7 for 15 on pull-up jump shots, and four of them are pull-up threes. So he's got a 60% effective field goal percentage on pull-ups. That's incredible. That that was basically what Steph led the league with last year. So good start there on that on that front. Three for four in floaters as well. The one weird thing with De'Aaron Fox is he's still missing at the rim. And if you remember, this was the story last year. Last year, De'Aaron Fox was like incredible at the rim. If I remember correctly, he shot over 70% at the rim. But then in the Warriors series, he really struggled to finish at the rim. And so far this year, he's only eight for 16. So I don't know what's going on there. I don't know if it's a decision-making thing, a spacing thing. But De'Aaron Fox is missing too many layups. Um, and they're getting nothing out of Kevin Herter right now. He's over, He was 0 for 5 on threes last night. He's 1 for 12 on jump shots so far this season. He's only attempted two shots at the rim. Main thing that I'm seeing on tape there is he's just taking extremely difficult shots. Like he basically comes off these dribble handoffs and either gets rid of the ball or shoots. And when he's looking for shot attempts, he's given that one, two footwork, right? Like if he's coming to the, to his right, he's planting that left foot, planting that right foot, and he's twisting in midair to square up and, and get that shot off. And it's just a really, really difficult shot. And so one of the things I'd like to see from Kevin Herter, and he can actually take this as a play a page from Clay Thompson's playbook, but use relocation dribbles. Be more willing to use that crazy uh, uh, lock and trail defender's momentum against him to find higher quality shots because that's 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 again when you're in when you're out of rhythm if you try to shoot yourself out of rhythm by taking more tough shots you're just going to get more and more discouraged but if you actually try to get out of your uh you know shooting slump by hunting down easier shots to build your confidence that can go a long way to getting him out of it so i again i just would like to see him put the ball on the floor a little bit more uh, to try to generate higher quality shots malik monk malik monk is also struggling to start the year uh, and that's hurting them with Fox off the floor. So far, they are minus five net in 51 possessions without De'Aaron Fox. So they are getting they're getting outscored by five points per 100 possessions. As a team, still not playing any defense. 113 defensive rating, and teams are shooting 78 percent against the Kings in the restricted area so far through two games. That is the second worst mark in the entire NBA. 